Hello friends, it's The Stitches. As much as I love sewing cute statement pieces, there was a particular basic staple garment that my wardrobe has been sorely missing. That being a ruffly black blouse that I can use for layering. So for today's video, I'll be making one using a vintage pattern from my collection. I got this Vogue blouse pattern in an antique shop a few years ago, and I kept meaning to use it, but never got around to it until now. I'll be making view B, but with a couple minor alterations. Once again, I was attempting to only use materials I already have. I did have to buy a couple small things, but the actual blouse fabric did come from my stash. However, I really wanted to make this blouse out of a really light, sheer black fabric, and I don't have any sheer black fabric. I do have this red sheer cotton voile that I bought seven yards of for a specific project a year or so ago. Let me double check the pronunciation on that. Voile. 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 I have no idea how to pronounce that word, but um, the internet is not helping. I'm just gonna use the highly Americanized version because you do not want to hear me attempt French. I ended up changing my mind and not wanting the thing that I bought this fabric for, so uh, oops. Luckily, this is a problem that fabric dye can fix. Blouse B requires pieces 1 through 3 and 5 through 10. Since I have 7 yards of my fabric and this garment requires far less than that, I was able to pretty much completely disregard the layout instructions. But here they are anyway, in case you're curious. I cut my pieces out first before dyeing them, which may have been a massive mistake, but oh well. The bigger mistake I made was not surging the fabric before literally boiling it and washing it several times. Predictably, one dye bath wasn't enough to turn my fabric completely black. It came out more of an espresso color. So before dyeing it again and letting my pieces fray any further, I installed the necessary darts and surged the edges. After that, they went back into the dye bath. After all of my pieces were successfully dyed, I realized that all of my interfacing was white. Normally this isn't an issue, you don't really need black interfacing unless you're working with a sheer black fabric that will allow the interfacing to show through the material. But since I am, in fact, working with a sheer black fabric, I needed black interfacing. Once I procured my interfacing from the fabric store, I cut the pieces I needed for my project. The biggest alteration I made to my blouse was to extend the front button placket all the way to the hem. That way the garment completely opens in the front instead of needing to be pulled over my head. So a lot of the instructions for constructing the front of the blouse don't really apply. Due to this, I won't be referring to them. The first step I'll actually be paying attention to is to iron the interfacing to the front band. The pattern says to baste the interfacing, but I'm guessing iron-on interfacing just wasn't as common when the pattern was manufactured. I didn't attach the band to the front of the blouse in the same order that the pattern instructs because it just wasn't my preferred method. I don't know if my math just wasn't mathing, or if some of my pieces got a little distorted after being boiled multiple times, but I did have to trim an inch and a half off of my altered front band. To be fair, I wasn't that precise when I was lengthening it, so it probably was just my math. After fixing the length of my pieces, I pinned the bands to the front of the blouse. Then I stitched them in place. At the ironing table, I folded the band over and pressed it. I also folded in the seam allowance and pressed it into place as well. After this is stitched down, the front bands are finished. 
pattern instructions state to refer back to view A for the next couple steps, but it's literally just to attach the front pieces to the back piece. This is also the point when the front darts were originally intended to be installed, but I've already done that. Since I am working with such a light, sheer fabric, and these construction seams are basically just straight lines, I decided to utilize the French seam method. To start this process, I pinned my pieces wrong sides together. The seam allowance on basically all commercial patterns is 5 8 of an inch, so when I stitched my pieces together I used a quarter inch seam allowance, or 2 8 of an inch. Then I pressed my seam allowance open, flipped my garment over, and then folded the seam in on itself. I pressed this along the seam again, creating a very clean edge, and then pinned it. Taking everything back over to the sewing machine, I stitched the folded in seam 3 8 inch from the edge, which for those of you who have been keeping up with the math, totals my full 5 8 inch seam allowance. And now it's time for a quick commercial break. Next it's time to move on to the neckband. First, I'll add some interfacing to one of my neckband pieces. The pattern instructions state to narrow hem the neck ruffle piece. I did this by folding in the serging, pressing it down, and then folding the fabric in a second time to encase the serging in fabric. This is then stitched in place. The next steps are to gather the ruffle and stitch it to the neckband. I used a white chalk pencil to mark the seam allowance onto the neckband. And then I did my gathering by hand instead of by machine because it's just my preference. The rest of the gathering for this project will be done by machine, but this is the longest piece that I had to gather, so I wanted to do it this way instead. I did my gathering in two sections, so it would be as even as possible and both sides of the neck would wind up with the exact same amount of fabric on them. Then the ruffle is stitched down at the machine. Then I'll be turning my attention to the tie pieces next. The two tie pieces were cut on the fabric bias to give them a little bit of stretch. These pieces definitely did get a little bit warped by the multiple dye baths, but I was able to tug at their edges a little bit to force them back into shape. These are folded in half and pressed. After stitching them at the sewing machine, I used the blunt edge of my chalk pencil to turn them right side out. And then once these two tie pieces are pressed flat, they're pinned to the neckband and then stitched. Next, there's some basting that the pattern instructions want me to do. So I took that second neckband piece that I've yet to do anything with, and at the ironing table I folded in the seam allowance along the bottom edge and pressed it in place. At the sewing machine, I set my stitch length to the longest setting and secured the seam allowance without any back stitching. This line of stitching will be pulled out later on when it's no longer needed, so I want to make that as easy for myself as possible. My instructions wanted me to trim away the seam allowance, but I left it as it was because trimming it just didn't feel right for some reason. I was worried I wouldn't have quite enough fabric to slip stitch it all together. The two neckband pieces are then pinned together with the ruffle and ties sandwiched in between them. And then they're stitched along the two narrow sides and the upper curve. To make it easier to turn everything right side out, I trimmed my corners and the ruffle seam allowance to remove as much bulk as possible. 
Then once the neck band was turned right side out, I pressed it as thoroughly as I could. Now the neck band is ready to be attached to the body of the shirt. First, I pinned the interfaced piece to the rest of the shirt. And then I stitched them together at the machine. For some reason, I forgot to film myself pressing the seam allowance, but I pressed it up in between the two neckband pieces. Then I used a seam ripper and picked out the basting on the inner neckband until I was able to just tug on it and pull it the rest of the way out. To finish the collar, I slip stitched the inner band in place. Then after a good press, the collar is done and I'm ready to move on to the sleeves. Once I started to read the instructions for the sleeve construction, I realized I made a pretty big mistake very early on in the sewing process. So remember when I installed all the darts when I was dyeing my pieces? I hadn't thoroughly read the full instructions for making the blouse yet, which is something you should always do before you start working with a pattern, and I assumed I was supposed to stitch the darts on the sleeves closed. Yeah, no, I wasn't supposed to do that. At least it's an easy fix. Before addressing the darts, I used the machine to create a row of long basting stitches along the shoulder cap of the sleeves for gathering, like the pattern instructs. Here you can see the dart that I absolutely should not have made. I stitched along the top of the dart, actually following the pattern instructions this time. This is just a line at the very point of the dart that's a couple inches long. Then I picked open my serging. This looks super messy, but trust the process. Now I'm able to carefully press the little tiny narrow hem into place where I thought I was supposed to make a normal dart. This creates a slit that will eventually be where the sleeve cuff opens and closes. Having this here is not only functional for the sleeve cuff, but it also allows more space for your hands when you're putting the shirt on, so you don't have to force your hand through a tiny little cuff that ideally perfectly fits your wrist. Here's the finished slit. One side looks a little bit rough here, but it's just because I hadn't finished picking out the serger thread, so it'll be nice and clean at the end, I promise. With my dart situation resolved, I folded my sleeves in half and pinned the side seam. And this is how far I got at the machine before I realized I wanted to make a French seam here as well. So pause, pick it out, repin, and start again. In this clip, I am actually stitching my sleeves wrong sides together with a quarter inch of seam allowance so I can make a French seam. Just like the seams on the body of the blouse, I pressed the seam allowance open, flipped my sleeve inside out, and then pressed the seam allowance back together, making a nice crisp edge for stitching. At the machine, I stitched it down with a 3 8 inch seam allowance, because math. Then I pressed the seam allowance to the side at the ironing table. And now it's time for a quick commercial break. Returning to my pattern instructions, it's time to start working on the cuffs. My first step was to add interfacing to two of my four sleeve cuff pieces. Next, my ruffle pieces are narrow hemmed. and then gathering stitches are basted along the top edge. I marked the seam allowance on my cuff pieces that I added interfacing to, 
Then I pinned my ruffles down and gathered them. This is then very carefully stitched together. I did have to pick it apart and redo a couple small sections because stitching down a ruffle on a curve, or rather a 90 degree angle like this, is unsurprisingly tedious. Then the non-interfaced cuff pieces are pinned to the interfaced cuff pieces with the ruffle sandwiched in between them. This is also stitched very carefully. Like on the neckband, I trimmed the seam allowance, clipped the corners, and used a corner press to turn the cuff pieces before thoroughly pressing them. With the cuffs constructed, it's time to attach them to the sleeves. To prepare the sleeve itself, I basted gathering stitches around the wrist. The wrist of the sleeve is then pinned to the cuff, specifically to the piece that was interfaced, and gathered to fit. Here you can see the gathering before I stitched it. At the machine, I'm only attaching the gathered sleeve fabric to the outer interfaced cuff piece right sides together. The non-interfaced cuff piece is left free. At the ironing table, I pressed the seam allowance in between the cuff pieces. I also turned up the seam allowance on the non-interfaced cuff piece, which is also the cuff lining. The inner part of the cuff is then slip stitched just like the inner neckband piece. This finishes up the sleeve cuffs, They'll get buttons eventually, but that happens at the very end. Now it's time to attach the sleeves to the rest of the blouse. First, I pinned the sleeves on up to the basted gathering stitches. I wound up gathering the sleeves completely out of frame because I am an expert YouTuber, but this is what it looks like at the end of the gathering process. Then I stitched the sleeves into place. Since French seams and curves do not really go together that well, I did a standard seam for this, but I didn't just want to leave the seam like that without further finishing, so I decided to make a satin binding. I measured around the seam so I knew how long of a binding I would need to make. The fabric I'm going to be using is the same sanded satin that I got for my black velvet vest. I had plenty left over so I used it to cut two pieces that were 2 inches wide by 16 inches long, which is the length of the seam allowance I was binding with a little extra worked in. At the ironing table, I folded the raw edges of my binding in half an inch. I did this on both the long edges and then pressed it down flat. Then I folded the binding in half with the raw edges tucked inside, creating a final width of half an inch. I pinned the binding to the seam allowance and stitched it down close to the edge. This is how it ends up looking. I then pressed the seam allowance in towards the sleeve at the iron. At this point, the blouse is almost completely done. It just needs the final few finishing touches. I hemmed the bottom edge of the blouse first because I clearly hate doing things in the order outlined in commercial patterns. This is a pretty quick process. I didn't have any buttons in my stash that I really liked on this blouse. I wanted something dainty and silver, but I couldn't find anything I loved, so I went with these basic black rounded buttons, mostly because they were pretty inexpensive and they looked better than any of my other options. 
I didn't want to have any buttons left over, so I set aside two for the sleeve cuffs, laid the remaining eight across the button placket, and spaced them apart at a distance that looked fairly aesthetically pleasing. I then marked the placements very clearly with a chalk pencil. I hand stitched my buttons in place, Then I took the blouse over to the machine and stitched my buttonholes. It's always a good idea to stitch a test buttonhole onto some scrap fabric first. I measured my test buttonhole and then made new markings on my blouse that I could stitch over so I knew exactly where to place the holes. This is the sewing equivalent of measure twice, cut once. My final step was to open the buttonholes and use a little bit of fray check on them. And now this project is officially done. I love this vintage pattern and I'd happily use it again to make another blouse. I'd especially like to try out one of the other views, but I'm also really glad I made the little changes that I did. I think this garment turned out beautifully and I am especially excited to have this as an essential basic that my wardrobe really needed. So now, you know what time it is if you've seen my other sewing vlogs. Let's look at a couple outfits. Both of these looks I've worn some variation of, with my white Baby the Starshine Bright blouse, but here you can see how much swapping out the blouse can really change how an outfit looks. For the first look, I'm using that black velvet vest that I mentioned earlier, and my charcoal bloomers. This is a very classic, romantic goth look that 13-year-old me would have absolutely screamed over. For my second look, I've paired the blouse with my matching pink and black plaid vest and shorts. The shorts were made using a pattern from the Gothic and Lolita Bibles, and the vest is a self-made pattern. This set looks very different with a black blouse. The top adds a lot of elegance that this outfit didn't otherwise have. That's all for today's video. I'm so happy I was able to find such a great vintage pattern in my actual size because this blouse fits me perfectly despite not resizing any part of it. I spent way more on it than I usually spend on secondhand patterns because like I said, I got it from an antique shop when I usually get patterns from thrift stores. It was totally worth it though. With that, I hope everyone has a good day, and I'll see you all next time. Bye!